<laughs> How's everyone going today? Well, good. Good. Last, last day, last grease talk. Last grease. Yeah. <laughs> Surely you've had enough. <laughs> Who was telling me, Katarina was saying, <laughs> there's a point where there's enough truth. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, that's it. <laughs> want, want everyone to go home just to absorb it. <laughs> yeah. Um, How's it been um, having all the intermingling of everyone together? It's, yeah. it's, it's lovely it's good to get to see. know each other a bit, yeah. isn't it, as well? Yeah. And we'd just like to also thank uh, those who were quite brave yesterday mm. talking about their uh, sexual stuff. And also would like to thank the spirits who were quite brave yesterday because there were quite a lot of spirits quite confronted by what I was saying yesterday. Uh, so we'd just like to thank them that they stayed engaged with us while we were <laughs> having those conversations. Um, that conversation in particular, remember that I mentioned about celibacy versus sadomasochistic and how both of them end up in stagnation. That was quite confronting for many spirits uh, who had practiced celibacy all of their life in the spirit world. So uh, they were quite confronted by that particular truth. And uh, so we see how they go with all of that today with some of these questions that you might come up with asking today. So as we said yesterday, uh, the general plan of action today is for us to have some questions for about an hour and a half, then we'll have a break, and then we'll uh, look at uh, the issues with regard to learning centre, locations uh, in terms of in Europe, and locations and... Uh, considerations and also uh, what can be done to facilitate the setting up of such a, such a centre in a manner that's conducive to, to love, I suppose, in, in, in harmony with love. So we'll discuss that in the second half of our session today. That's the, discussion, that's the two discussions. Okay, so um, we can get started on the questions that you may have. Uh, the which microphone's out there, yep. Yeah. Yeah, cool. can, can you just go straight back behind you if you... Yeah? There we go. Hi again. Good morning. Good morning. Um, afternoon. Yeah. Afternoon, yeah. Afternoon. Um, I've got millions of questions, so obviously I can't hog your time. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, if I understood correctly, you said that the soul splits into two. Yes. And the two soulmates try to find each other. Yes. And, they are, and they come into the material world and are born into a physical body and a spiritual body. That's correct. Would that not imply that the soulmates are born on the same date? Um, no, it, it doesn't happen that way actually. Um, if I can explain how it happens uh, in terms of a bit more detail. So remember you've got the unincarnated soul that is in its unified state, uh, sitting in, the, in what you would call, um, well it's, it's actually sitting in a place that's in the same place that you finish up it with the soul union state when you grow. And let's call that the 22nd dimension, which is a fair way in progression. But this, this is just sitting there in that state in a condition where it doesn't understand itself as we explained and then when uh, when it, it's ready for incarnation and now this location by the way is not like as if it's like millions of millions of billions of miles away or anything like that it's actually surrounding every earth or place where there is procreation occurring between human couples and so as a result of that every act of procreation or even the potential like so any time a couple actually has sex there is an actual affinity of these souls surrounding that particular couple based on the personalities of the couple and the emotional injuries of the couple so there's a there's a law of attraction even working there which this soul itself is not conscious of but the couple who are, who are engaged in the sex act uh, are drawing that particular soul to themselves now, so you imagine, so if we, if we drew it this way, the, the couple, so the couple on earth is engaged in sexual activity. Right? There's a drawing of a particular soul that matches the combined um, condition of their personality combined with also many of their emotional injuries all combining to create a law of attraction between this soul and this couple. And the... the, the the most risk-taking part of the soul will separate from this soul in, and separate. And when the, when the 
let's say it's the male, let's say the child is conceived, at that moment the two bodies are created and they begin the process of uh, multiplication of the cell structures of those bodies, then this part of the soul is attracted to it. Now, from that moment on, the second part of the soul is actually also... So you could think of here's the male part of the soul. The second part of the soul that is yet unincarnated remains very close to that soul, right? And it just stays there waiting for its chance to incarnate. And so, so for that reason, uh, many people will find that their soul mate is of a, the same, even the same nationality or in the same location same or the, of the same world. region uh, of area that uh, they so because the second soul is constantly now drawn to the first part of the soul that's incarnated, but it's also looking for an opportunity to incarnate in the similar location. And, and of course, it, it has to be drawn to a couple also. Yeah, so and it's and not it, just any couple, is so it? So there's it's another a, couple. Yeah, it has to be drawn to. And of course, the same laws of attraction are applying. In other words, this couple has a group of a personality between the two of the couple, they have a certain emotional injuries and so forth, and this particular soul finds an affinity with that particular couple, and that's the strongest affinity. And so when this couple finish up having sex and create the bodies for the, for the in this case, the feminine part of the soul, then this part of the soul connects to those bodies. And, uh, and then the, the, you could say the individualization from that moment of this complete soul is now complete. They can both even pass away while they're still within the womb, but the process of individualization has been completed. They are now in a sensitive, soul-aware state where they're starting to absorb information from the universe. When they're in this state, they're not in a sensitive, self-aware state to absorb information from the universe. It's only once they get into this state. The other interesting thing about this soul, incarnation of the soul, is that this half of the soul actually needs the bodies in order to, in, to absorb from, it, from the universe, but the complete soul does not need bodies to absorb information from the universe. So, so for that reason, while we're in a half of the soul state, we are always going to need either a physical body or a spirit body to absorb information from the universe. Now, as you progress through the different dimensions, and remember, there's the first sort of seven dimensions, so one to seven, then there's the into it one with God in the eighth dimension, and then there's the progression to, let's call it the 22nd dimension at this stage, shall we call it that? And at that point, the soul can reunify now, at that point, the, the, the soul doesn't need the bodies to use the soul's senses and to absorb information from the universe in a, in a self-aware state. So um, the bodies are only necessary while the halves of the soul are actually separate from each other, if that makes sense. So the process is uh, the one half of the soul in Cana first, the second half of the soul will follow that first half looking for the appropriate personality parents to actually be attracted to and the, the gap between the first half and the second half incarnating may be as long as 20 up to 20 years or so it's rare that it's longer than that but it may be up to that uh, type of dis distance in time because the personality doesn't quite match the the uh, you know the couple. personality of this soul doesn't quite match what's going on with the couple that are that are making love so yeah does that make sense yeah Thank you very much. And also took care of my two next questions, which was the location and the death. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, good eye. So yeah, with location, um, a lot of people are worried about where their soulmates are. You don't need to worry so much about that because there's a high likelihood when you engage those three aspects of desire, truth and love inside of your own soul and you follow your passions with passion, then your soulmate, if they are alive on the earth, will be attracted to you. And if your soulmate is not alive on earth, they'll probably already be with you in the spirit state. And it's just a matter of becoming aware of that as you open up those particular pathways within yourself. So you don't really need to worry so much about the location and where they possibly are. But the truth is that the majority of people will finish up being in the same or similar culture 
uh, or nearby locations. So, for example, if somebody was incarnated here in Greece, it doesn't mean that their soulmate is Greece, is Greek, Gre is Greek but, but they could be any of the countries nearby. Um, it just depends on a whole lot of factors, including particularly the attraction of the two parents that are, that are having, sexual, uh, having a sexual union. So the, the key is to um, not worry too much about that, but, but use this technique that God has given us, and that is to open up our desires and passions, live in harmony with truth and love. When you live in that state, the attraction will automatically occur. And what a lot of people find happening, though, which is very interesting, is a lot of people find that they've actually known their soulmate. Once they start activating those particular things, they start realising, oh, yeah, they start having feelings about one particular person in their past. Uh, and, so, and many people find that they have met their soulmate in the past but just didn't recognise them at the time um, because of a lot of various factors, mostly to do with emotional injuries. But because of a lot of various factors, we don't get together with our soulmate at the time. Yeah. Yep. Um, should we go across to Patricia? Uh, sorry. Uh, there you go. That's Patricia, isn't it? Yes. 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 And, yep. and then back to Danny. Yeah. Yep. It's a different topic. Yeah. What does it mean to be at one with God? Um, I've answered that question so many times before, oh. Patricia, in a lot of the presentations, so I don't know whether it's worth spending more time uh, answering it today. Um, my suggestion is to actually uh, watch the presentations that are now on YouTube, if you haven't had the opportunity, um, to do with uh, prayer, longing for divine love, longing for divine truth. Um, if you that's can, all in that pack. That that's in that is pack. Not, yeah. pack. Yes. That, that are there. If you haven't got a copy of those, grab yep. a copy of those. Because in there, I explain in detail what you know, one with God is, and also uh, over the years, there've been different people asking me different questions mm -hmm. of what it feels like and so forth. Yes. And I've explained a lot of the feelings that are involved in that state. Okay, I look yeah. out for that because yeah. I've missed that so far, and it's a concept that I have a bit of a, a hard time relating to because it feels like something that might apply to other people, but not really something that right. I might aim for. It seems yeah. very grand and very lofty. And yeah. So I, I look out for that. It's, inter <laughs> it's interesting that you call it that, and I feel that there's some spirits asking the question through you now. Um, and it's interesting you call it very grand and very lofty. The, the reality is very different. If you could imagine a, a, a person who's like a child who's in their own emotions completely, but they are completely free of any negative emotions. So in other words, they never experience anger or hatred or resentment or any of those grief. other kinds of emotions, yeah. grief even. But they are very emotional, they're very passionate, very, you know, the child's just doing its thing, you know, mm -hmm. in, in life. And imagine that child now growing up as an adult, but exactly the same type of uh, life where they're not worried about what everybody around them thinks of them they don't when I say not worried they don't have any consideration whatsoever of what anybody thinks of them but so, they're in a, a state of love with everyone around them yeah so yeah. They, they don't they, they treat a person who's angry with them with the same amount of love as a person who likes them and they you know they are in a state of consistent joy constantly and they're in a state of consistent peace internally, constantly. But they, it, yes. they also are absorbing truths from the universe constantly. So they're constantly growing. They're like a child in constant experimentation with the universe. There's no resistance to learning. Um, so imagine for a moment, instead of you having like, you know, most of us have deep resistances to learning new things. Um, this child, now an adult, the same kind of feeling as the child, uh, has no resistance to learning new things, no, no shut down emotions, mm -hmm. no, no feelings of resistance in them uh, to, to changing or growing. Um, and if you can imagine this constant state of internal peace and well-being, knowing that you're loved by God constantly. There's, no, there's never a break in that condition where you feel you're, that God loves you. Um, so you imagine the peace of that state, um, that's the state of being at one with God. It's not a lofty position. It's not a sort of austere sort of um, formal place. It's quite a, um, 
disarming place. It's it's very yeah. there's a lot it's of very love, playful, <laughs> but as it's well. very playful, relaxed. Yeah. 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 Can I add on just a little sure, bit sure. something, which is about if I'm in that state or if someone is in that state, is it? Uh, do the effects of that spread outside of themselves? Yes. yes. I get the feeling that it does. Yes, yes. very it, much so. That, yeah. it, it, it spreads to billions of people, actually, uh, at the soul place. Because the person is now open to every emotional experience, they're not judgmental at all. They have total openness with truth and love. Every single person around them cannot but help to be affected by their life. Now, some of the people around will be affected negatively. In well, other that, words, they will feel it's negative. They will feel it's negative. They'll feel feelings of jealousy, hatred, anger, rage, and so forth. Mostly because they feel the comparison between themselves and the person in that state. And then they feel like automatically they're being judged by the person even just existing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Or, and also because of the confrontation. You remember yesterday yes. we talked a lot about the codependent addictions mm -hmm. that basically most of our relationships operate in. Because this person at one with God doesn't even consider that they would meet an addiction in the other person, mm -hmm. it's very confronting. Yeah. They feel like they're not being loved. They feel like um, yeah. they want to demand from this. And this person, do, it doesn't even affect them. Yeah. Yeah. this demand so uh, it confronts the error within everyone around uh, and that is actually a loving th beautiful thing really yeah. if you think about it because it, it starts them in the process of confronting the error which can then lead to them becoming more loving yeah. so the reality is when you're one with God you don't everyone doesn't automatically like you right because, but there will be people that just like you and they don't really understand why. Mm -hmm. But then there's also people who will just hate you and they don't really understand why either. You know, but and these many people who confronted. open emotionally because there's a person who has no resistance to emotion. Uh, so in the presence of that person, there's a deep feeling of it's okay to be myself however I am. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people spontaneously, even actually not... Be knowing the person, but in the vicinity of that person, spontaneously opening emotionally. Yeah. Because, you know, we talk constantly about the effect of injuries on the law of attraction, the effect of injuries on the way the planet works and the emotions in kids and the way s structures work. Well, conversely, because God's love is far more powerful than any hateful emotion, just one person in a state of atonement has a massive effect on the law of attraction on, on everything around them. Mm. It's far more powerful than a person in... We, we have this common conception that dark forces are, are very powerful and scary, and, and I know I certainly have had that feeling... Um, but the truth is God's love is a far more powerful force. So just one person living in harmony with that has like a hugely mm. beautiful effect here. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, the best way to illustrate it, Pauline, in the end is for one person to get into that state. And once one person's in that state in front of you, then you have an idea what that state looks like and feels like. Um, and that's what uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to return Earth is to go through the process of demonstrating how to get into that state and then to get into the state for the point of view of demonstrating what the state looks like and what the state feels like so that, every, so that those people who have been interested in the process before then can have a lot more faith that they can also get to that same state or condition um, it just through their desire and passion being activated. Yeah. We're not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Um, who was next? Ben? You uh, Dionysus. Yeah. And then if we go, if we just then work to Katerina and then come and up come front down. after that. Yep. Hi. Yep. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, you stated yesterday that um, the soul is supplying our bodies with energy. Sorry. The, the soul supplies the, soul the bodies. Supplies with our energy. bodies. Energy, yes. Energy. Yes. Uh, so where do animals get their energy if they do not have a soul? They get their energy through from their spirit body. They get their energy from God, actually, from the universe. But when mankind is around, they also absorb the energy of mankind. So, so for animals, if we can uh, sort of describe it. Um, so an animal, you yeah, let's uh, let's draw. A, I'm not very good at drawing animals, <laughs> even <laughs> stick figures, right? So. <laughs> Peter can do it for you. So there's the animal. Right. <laughs> he has a, 
<laughs> he has a he's a he's a non identified animal. You wouldn't believe it, but I, I can be an artist sometimes, but you can't believe it in these <laughs> sessions. Um, now, he has a spirit body as well, um, and, but the, the way God has... God has a number of different energies that she delivers to the universe to maintain the universe, and one of these energies is what you would sometimes or have heard about called pr pranic energy, or the energy or life force-based energy, and animals basically, um, they have a spirit body. So if I draw a similar body for the spirit, for the spirit animal, <laughs> embarrassment even further. <laughs> right? So there's the spirit, so there's the physical body of the animal. And this applies to an animal that has a central nervous system. So the, the living creatures that do not have central nervous systems do not have a spirit body. They only exist in the physical world they don't actually exist in the spirit world. Because they cannot conduct the energy through their... Um, no, they are all... Uh, all the living creatures that do not have a central nervous system are, are created by God for the maintenance of the physical world. So they are key, key uh, components for the maintenance of the physical world. For, for example, most insects uh, do not have a central nervous system. And, and they are maintaining the physical world. That is their purpose. That's their purpose. They have what you would classify as a collective consciousness, if you like, which is totally determined by the soul condition of mankind. And if mankind doesn't exist on a planet, then it's totally determined by the energy they receive from God, if that makes sense. So, so the reality is that we have God supplying energy or you could say through her love supplying an energy that continues maintaining the life of these animals and um, but the way God's created it is here mankind is the way God's created it is these animals are very very sensitive to mankind's uh, energy or you could say the best way to look at it is mankind's emotions projected at the animals so that's why animals often reflect our emotional condition. This yeah. is why animals get sick and have injuries and uh, die. That's also why other, some animals eat other animals and so forth. A lot of this is all about mankind and mankind's collective emotional condition, mankind's soul condition, that it's out of harmony with love. So if mankind did not exist on the earth, the animals would all exist in peaceful coexistence with each other and in symbiotic harmony. When you add mankind to the picture, now the animals are feeling the soul condition of mankind and are feeling, in particular, the emotions of mankind, not only the emotions of mankind projected at the animals, but the emotions of mankind pr that are felt towards each other, even. So, for example, many males have a feeling on this planet, most males have a feeling of competitiveness with other males for a woman's attention. So, so that is also then imposed upon the animals and the animals act out the competitive nature of males for a woman's attention by actually attacking other males in the animal kingdom for the sake of uh, copulating with the, with the females, right? And so you see a lot, of this stuff where, a lot of these things where there's anger and rage, for example, in many males towards the female. You will also see that reflected in the animal kingdom with specific animals and specific animals have a specific personal personality type and natures I mean as a group uh, and so they become very sensitive to certain types of emotions whereas other animals become sensitive to other types of emotions and um, so for example a cat becomes very sensitive to emotions uh, in in the owner so much so that any emotion in the owner of unworthiness the cat will exploit so um, do you understand what I mean by that? Like, so, so, for example, this is the reason why most cats, and I'm including even the big cats, um, are exploitative in their nature of, with regard to their relationship with the, their owners. Generally, if they, if they have a relationship with a person, they are exploitative in their nature. In other words, they make demands upon the person. Um, They'll demand what they want to eat and they'll refuse. They'll snub their nose, as the saying goes, to anything that they don't want to eat, for example. And that's because they're very, very sensitive to the emotion in the human that the, the human will bend their will to suit. To suit. And so uh, a, an animal can help 
if you have a pet, and that pet can help you heal a lot of emotions inside of yourself just by looking at the reflections. Um, the animals also have accidents and get sick based on the human's um, main emotional condition. Now, if we have a domestic pet, so a cat or a dog or something like that, they are very sensitive to their particular owner. They are, they are sensitive mostly to the owner who either owns them or loves them the most, and they will be sensitive as a, because of that to any of the unhealed emotions that are unloving in, the, in that owner and they will act out those emotions uh, through different interactions with other animals and with other people. So um, now when they pass, when the, when the physical body separates, and again the physical body separating is, if, if it's dependent upon the owner, then what will happen is the owner can maintain the physical body of an animal if there is a, if there is a love-based relationship Theoretically, it's possible for that animal to maintain its life on earth for the entire life of this owner. Right? If the owner has cleared away all unloving emotions, all of their belief systems about death, all of their belief systems about longevity and so forth, then this animal is able to live as long as the owner will live on the planet. Uh, it's based on love, you said. That, uh, Sorry, lo it's, it's on love. On, on love, on yeah. Love, yeah. yeah. So the energy would flow to the animal also? Yes, uh, so the owner's energy now is also now sustaining the animal, in e other words. Energy of love, I mean. Okay. Yes, the energy yeah. of love, but if you think of it as the emotion of love, yeah. but it's not just the emotion of love, it's also, so we can have love for our animal, many people do, but they also have many unhealed emotions and belief systems that you must heal and, and, and remove from yourself if you want the animal to live as long as you do. <laughs> then but you describe the perfect uh, condition. In a perfect condition, the animal will live, will live as long as the human chooses to live, yes. If, if I feel love for my dog, but I'm holding on to huge emotions, <coughs> say of resentment with men, excuse me, <coughs> and this is a male dog, uh, then the dog is going to, even if it's a female dog, they'll start to reflect, that just as it affects my spirit body, begins to affect theirs as well because I'm in connection with that animal. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, that um, sorry. Yep, go ahead. No, go. Uh, if uh, someone passes who is not in a very good condition and also the spirit body of his dog, let's say, is not in a good condition, uh, while he is improving in the spirit world, uh, will also the spirit body of his yep. dog... Well, remember, this, the, the dog is receiving energy from two sources, not just from one. So it's receiving this uh, energy of life from God, and then it's also receiving the connectivity or the energy from the owner. And love will dictate how that dog responds. So if, this, if the owner is in very, very poor condition, the dog will not pass into the same location. So, so for instance, if the owner passed into the hells of the spirit world, the dog will not pass into that location. They will pass probably somewhere in the top of the first sphere at least in the spirit world. And they will basically be waiting around there until the owner reconnects with some of the emotions that it felt about the dog and so forth. And then as the owner progresses, the dog and, and the owner will probably meet up again at some point in the future and then when they meet up again love will determine how whether they stay together now if there is a strong feeling of love from the owner to the animal then the animal will continue just going wherever the the owner goes through the spirit world and there are animals all the way through the spirit world there's also animals you can create in the spirit world so you can you can create and ask god to infuse the animal with a life force and, uh, and you can create animals in the spirit world. And for that reason, there are very many, much larger variety of anim animal animals in the spirit world than there are here on earth. Because you can actually create the, physic the spirit body of an animal while you're in the spirit world. Um, can they enter the 22nd sphere? They can enter any dimension that is, of a, that is spiritual bodied in nature. So they cannot enter the 22nd sphere. They cannot enter the soul. Remember, that's state. the soul... That's the soul plane, and these guys don't have a soul. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. by the time you reach that plane, the soul union state, um, you are able to interact with any other state anyway. So you're able to interact with all other states. So you're able to interact with the physical, with the spirit world, all the way through the dimensions, and the soul world, if you like, where, where you're in the soul union state. But, uh, but by that stage, you've, you do not feel the necessity of having animals as a part, uh, being joined with animals 
as you might do here on earth. By that time, you've sort of let go of a lot of that kind of thing. In fact, you can create, by this stage, you can create and manifest your own creations. And so there's no need for you to, uh, or, or desire for you to have a specific animal connected with you, if that makes sense. So you, it's the same actually with family. By the time you reach the one state, uh, with this, the eighth dimensional state, um, you're, not very, you're not actually concerned about family at all. It, you, there's no such thing as family actually at that point. Um, so um, you view the whole human race as your family, just like God views all of the human race as her children. And so you then view all of the human race as your brothers and sisters, and you don't have a particular affinity to one member of that, uh, of that human race unless there is a strong binding force other than family that draws you together to interact. Um, so, for example, um, my mother and father, Joseph and Mary, I've always had a strong connection with, but not because they are my father and mother, but rather because they, when they, particularly when they hit the spirit world, they listened more to the divine love and divine truth, and they were quite passionate in the growth of it in terms of themselves, and so they were quite near where myself and Mary used to live in the spirit world, and as a result of that, you spend a lot of time with them, but it's not because they're your mum and dad. It's because they have the same desires, the same passions and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can we just... Thank you just, very much. You know, just, you talk, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you're interrupting the flow of people who've had the... Uh, is it about this is question? Is it related to this? Can you can hold you just, the microphone? Just, uh, I just wanted to, you, you to uh, confirm this, the, the level that you said that happens on when you don't have a connection anymore with... With family? Um, yes. Yep. Um, it actually begins to occur, uh, the connection to family, if you look at the dimensions that exist. So we start one, two, three. The connection to family begins to generally fade by the time you make the transition between the second and the third dimension. And, and by the time, so there's four, five, six, seven, by the time you're at one with God, which is the eighth dimension you have no real concept of family that is, uh, is held here on earth. And that's the concept of preference for family, like prefer like uh, Like you don't have a preference for your children, for example. Above anyone else. You yep. may still be in a loving relationship with your children, but you wouldn't value that above a loving relationship with somebody else. It's, it's purely, and your, um, your close associations are purely based on individual personality, desire, um, yeah. passions and, and the, some the of only, your children there is only one exception to that and that is the relationship with your soulmate exactly. your soulmate yeah. relationship is the most binding relationship you will ever be in and in fact it continues to cement itself in solidity as you grow and as a result of that your soulmate relationship becomes the dominate, dominating relationship in your life and all other relationships uh, like Mary just said just, they're just based on affinity and desires and passions yeah. does that make sense? Yeah. Um, now, who are we Katerina, down to? Katerina, and then we're going to come down the front here. <coughs> um. Um, can I just stop? Is there any more questions about this, the animals versus people thing? Good. Okay, cool. let's move on. Um, I have a lot of terror about this question. It mm -hmm. regards sexuality mm -hmm. and. Um, as I'm contemplating, I'm asking yesterday and today, I have physical reactions, and now Arturo is getting scared. He says, why do you need to ask it for? Mm -hmm. So I feel I need to ask. Um, in our sexual union together, 90% of the time we struggle to have the orgasm either together or to even have one. Only 10% of the time we're synchronized. Mm -hmm. Um, or even less, if I want to be honest. And I find myself really struggling to even stay in the interaction while I'm there. And I don't have much desire for him throughout the week, whereas he has desire for me every day mm -hmm. and is ready in a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. And then he struggles to wait for me because he's ready to have an orgasm like really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So we have to find techniques, and we've been together 11 years, and 
and we worked at it a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, but we just have to struggle with this because we desire each other, and it's just there's stuff in between. The key, Katerina, is to to start not viewing it as a struggle so much, but view as it as an experiment more, right? And um, let's let's start by looking at some of the emotions present. Okay. So, with most couples on the planet, um, there is there are a number of things um, impeding our sexual connection. And remember yesterday we said the most pure sexual connection is going to be with your soulmate. We also said that you have to also at the same time be quite developed for that, for that connection to be pure. And when we say quite developed, we have to have released most of our emotional injuries. And a lot of our injuries pertain around sex, but they also are related to other factors about ourselves. For example, many women do feel the emotion that they're not beautiful now. Uh, they used to be at some point, you know, usually by the, when they were 16 or 17 or something like that. And then by the time they're in their 30s, and particularly by the time you reach the 40s, many women are starting to feel like, I'm not beautiful anymore. You know, why would anybody... You look at those young women, they're, they're much more beautiful, you know, than I am now and so forth. So there are emotions, let's call them, and I don't like using this term, but I'll use it anyway. Let's call it worthiness or sexual, sexual worthiness where it pertains particularly to our appearance, our beauty, um, our body, our body general, yeah. image, and all of those kind of things. Um, also, for, um, for many men, they do have a feeling that they are sexually worthy, um, and they do have a feeling, but they also have, many men have a feeling of, of wanting to uh, take sexually, or, or of frustration sexually, because because when many, with many women, as time goes along, they're, they're closing down, many women close down more and more emotionally and sexually. And as a result then, the men become quite frustrated and annoyed with how long it takes for the woman to orgasm and so forth. And so then the, men's, the men get to a point where they no longer feel like they should uh, spend that time. Um, because it just now feels like the woman's sort of demanding more and more and more and more time. The reality is what's happening at the soul level is there is fear usually inside of the woman and shame that she needs to release. These are multi-generational emotions that we discussed yesterday. And they, those emotions build up and build up and build up. And then as she grows older, they of course build up because her body is, Im image is also changing. Whereas when she was younger, she might have been a lot slimmer and... Uh, and she looked prettier, let's say, and so forth, and looked more beautiful to look at and so forth. And so to her own self, you know, she looks more beautiful then than she does now. And so she then starts shutting down more and more and more. Her, her sexual unworthiness, if you like, grows. Now as a result of that, a wall starts appearing in the sense that the woman now is becoming more and more resistive to her own body feelings She's stepping more and more away from herself, particularly sexually. And so she's now feeling less sexual worthiness. She's feeling like, why would the man want to make love to me anyway? Like, I've got this bump here and that bump there and, you know, and all of these and, other things. And I feel really ashamed and about what I've done in the past. When I connect to my body, I'm reminded of things that I've done in the past. Yeah. So every time you get into bed, if you want to use... You're, you're having to go over the top of all of these feelings of unworthiness sexually, all of this shame, all of this fear, whoa, intimacy, whoa, 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 to get to orgasm. Which is a lot of effort, let's face it. And most women be start becoming quite frustrated with that effort. And then most men also start becoming quite frustrated with that effort because it takes a bit of effort on their part to engage all of this. Does that make sense? And so they start feeling, well, they're not feeling this way. They still feel like they want to have sex with their wife and they still feel like they can orgasm easy enough. So what they do is they give up to a degree trying to help the wife through this problem because the wife herself is actually many times closed down towards the primary emotions that are going to fix the problem. So it's like, it's like every time the man goes, but isn't this about fear? The wife goes, well, yes, but I'm allowed to have my fear, sort of thing. So she wants to stay in her fear. Or any time he notices some shame and he might mention it, why are you so ashamed? She goes, well, you know, gets upset with him for pointing out that she's ashamed, which is actually getting upset 
about the causal emotion that is shutting her down. So he then goes, I might as well give up trying to please her or make her orgasm or any of those things and I'll just focus on my, my pleasure and my orgasm after that. And this is why uh, that has a tendency of occurring in many relationships. Now, I've only indicated one of a number of different emotions that might be the cause. Specifically, I'm answering your question. Yeah. In other words, I'm talking about yes. the cause between the two yes. of you here. And of course, the cause between other couples are going to be different depending on the different emotional conditions that exist between that couple. But as your fear and shame grow, uh, grows, and, and when I say grows, it's always been there. It's just been lessened by the fact that you were younger, prettier, and more available and all these other things. And so lessened by also you skipping out of your fear. You used to go out of your body a lot when you were younger, you know, to get away from any fear-based situation or yes, any shame. all the time. And now you're practicing trying to stay in your body, stay connected, stay present. And of course that then means that you feel more of these emotions. And as a result of that, a sort of a physio or a break starts appearing sexually in the relationship. So you still may love each other, but, but the feeling is that like, I can't engage sexually anymore. Now, fear and shame shut down desire. Anything to do with unworthiness within us uh, shuts down passion and desire. So the male also may have feelings of sexual unworthy, like he's now fa feeling frustrated too because he feels like he can't please his woman anymore. He used to be out of, and now he can't. You know, there's, so those feelings grow within him. And the key, the key is to address the, um, these feelings emotionally, to release those feelings emotionally. So yeah. to do that, the woman has to fear her, feel her sexual fear and shame. Now that, for most women, is a very daunting task because not only does she have to fear, feel her own fear and shame sexually about what happened in her own life, but actually there are many multi-generational injuries from past women who have lived on in the past, generationally, that have imposed these sets of injuries. So, for example, women in the past were just treated as possessions, for example. So all of those women in the past who were treated as possessions never released their emotion while they're on earth. So generally they passed that emotion down to the next generation of women. Then they passed into the spirit world still feeling that emotion. So now they're trying to connect to women on earth saying, you're just being treated as a possession. You're just being, you know, while... I feel even. them and they wouldn't let me ask the question or hurting yeah. my ears, hurting my throat, yeah. having heartburn. And yeah. they're like, don't, don't do this. Don't no, do this. We're no. going to be exposed. Many of the women don't even wish, in the spirit world now I'm talking about, do not wish any of the women on earth to heal their sexuality. They don't want to heal it because they believe that's the place, the place of soulmate union, they believe is the weak place. They believe that is a very they weak... They feel that it can be harmed again. And in harmful, place, yeah. potentially harmful place. Not understanding that if a soulmate union occurs, then it can only occur in love and therefore it can never be harmful. Mm -hmm. So they don't understand that. They're very afraid of that. They're very afraid of giving their will over to the man Right? And so whenever you want to discuss getting closer to your man, they then think that that means giving your will to the man. And that's not the same thing, but they think it's the same thing. And as a result, they get a lot of fear and anger in them about that. These women spirits who have had multi-generational injuries still in the spirit world, still, in fact, many of them attached to the earth. In other words, they're earthbound. And so what they do is they connect to the woman now who's feeling these feelings. They're trying to help the woman not feel those feelings because they don't want to feel the feelings, the spirits themselves, which actually shuts the woman down even further. It makes the man now feel like there's a lot of resistance now. So he then now starts attracting spirits who are now resentful with women about sex. So in other words, he starts feeling feelings like, I might as well get my sex elsewhere, if that's the way it's going to be. you know, or, or I might not get it elsewhere, but I might as well just take my pleasure and be done with it rather than trying, you know, for hours on end to help my woman orgasm when she doesn't really want to deal with the reasons why she's not. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, you, uh, yeah, Keep I going. just want to add to that. Um, uh, uh, what I want to say about orgasm <laughs> is I feel it's about <coughs> anger. This difficulty with orgasm, anger, control... And I'd actually put above that rage. Yeah. 
Like the, the most intense form of anger. Yeah. yeah. So difficulty with orgasming with a partner for myself has been a lot about these emotions. Um, a, a feeling like um, a lot of rage with men, specifically with my soulmate. A feeling that I don't want to give my body over to him. I don't want him to have control of my body. What will happen if he has... I give him total sexual control, he leaves me hanging, he doesn't care for me. You know, a lot of vulnerability feelings, like if I share my sexual self with him... A lot of it's about him, love too, though, isn't it? If I give him my heart in love, he my, will just abuse that. Yeah, my orgasm and my heart are very Connected. related. <laughs> like, if, if, I, if I give him my orgasm, I've given him my heart, my, but also, yeah. as I give my heart, my 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 orgasm happens and then I feel out of control. This man is in charge of my body. So if this man dies now, or this man, you know, leaves... Whoa. Where are you left? Yeah. You're left not being able to give your heart or, or sexually to another person. And, uh, and where does that leave you? Yeah. The thing is, um, with our tour, he's actually the only one that I was able to have an orgasm almost every time. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, it was absolutely impossible. And I was never satisfied, ever. I had, yeah. like, really pleasure from this. It was like, a, mm -hmm. like, what's the reason of having sex? Yeah. So that's the thing. Like, together we do work yeah. this, and it's fantastic because... Yeah. yeah. But it's still this thing about me delaying him wanting to go faster and, like... Well, can, I, can I just... I, don't know, yeah. you, I feel, Katerina, there's still more Mary needs to say about these because okay. this is where many... It, it's all... Where if your body, one thing that I've always said to Mary is if your body is a perfect machine, it responds perfectly to everything, right? And if it's not responding perfectly, it's not because of the body. It's actually because of the emotions that control the body. Do you understand? So, so what we need to understand is if this perfect machine isn't working perfectly, it's not because of the problem with the perfect machine. Right? It's the problem with the soul that's driving it. And the soul is all to do with belief systems and emotions. Right? So it's all got these emotions controlling and driving the, soul, the body. Now, if, so, so for example, if you cannot orgasm, uh, and many women cannot, in today's age even, orgasm, and it's understandable why. Because they have many emotions, which their bodies are okay, the bodies work, but they have many emotions controlling how the body will respond in any situation. And when those emotions are not embraced and felt, then it's impossible for the body to actually have the responses it would normally have due to the condition of the soul, the emotions that are being yes. in the soul. It's very important to understand that basic principle when you're dealing with sexual matters. Does, it, does that make sense to everyone? If you're dealing with any sexual matters where things are not working properly, it's always important to understand the basic principle that the body itself works properly. And the only reason why the body doesn't work properly naturally is because the soul, remember, we're made up of the soul, the half of the soul, so in this case the feminine, and the two, the two bodies, right? Sorry about the dress, bit of a miniskirt there. And uh, so physical body and spirit body and the soul. Now what I'm saying is both of these bodies respond to the soul, not to anything else. So even with regard to like touch, how that touch enters the soul of Mary as a feeling is going to be very dependent upon the emotions that are present inside of Mary's soul. Not, it's not anything to do with the body. The truth is that I should be able to just touch her like that and she will just have waves of pleasure come over her just by that one touch. That's possible. Your body is possible to do that because just the process of touching the body creates all these energy flows in your spirit body and you can just have waves of tingling, pleasurable sensations that are, that are not the same as sex, but are just as intense and pleasurable as sex, just travelling all over your body, just from the touch. Now, if that is not happening, it's not because of the body's fault. 
is because of the emotions that prevent the flow of that touch and then the flow of the subsequent energy it creates into the soul, which is the source of the feeling of all of it, which is the, the receptor, if you like, of all of those feelings. And it's very important to understand that any emotion, this is what point Mary's getting at, is any emotion that is inside of your soul, it, and particularly emotions related to sexual matters, but all sorts of emotions actually, are going to affect that soul's ability to actually feel the body. And as a result of that, the body feels almost like it's like you touch it and it's like touching nothing. Like the touch doesn't enter. And so you touch your sexual organs and it's like that it's like touch nothing. doesn't yeah, enter. Like, like it doesn't yeah. happen. Yeah. 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 So, so if Mary can explain further, I just wanted to put that background in there for you because it's very important when you're working on sexual issues to understand there's nothing wrong with our bodies. There's everything wrong with, how, with, with regard to the emotions that, and, and belief systems that our soul contains that affect the connection, the, the, recept, the sensitivity of our soul to receiving the signals from the body is the determining factor. Does that make sense? And the, the, the sexual signals are just the same as any other signal like taste, touch, sight, any other signal. The sensitivity of all of those signals are all dependent upon the soul's openness to the recep reception of those signals. Yeah? But for most of us, we're very numb. We don't really taste, we don't really feel, we don't really feel other people very much because of the shutdown of so much emotion within us. Mm. I just, I, I, I know this very well. <laughs> um, I live this. So I just wanted to say a few things from my own experience. Um, I found it's very easy to get into feelings of frustration, self-punishment, this feeling, I don't work, my body doesn't work. Uh, it's like, it's hopeless, a lot of those kind of feelings. They are all effect feelings to, to something with a very different cause. And what I had to come to recognise about my body was, as AJ said, is my body works fine. And my body really does work fine. It's just that I don't really want to be in it most of the time. And especially during sex, this was a big issue for me. I would just... Even my body was sort of aroused, but I was somewhere else. Like, and I couldn't actually right. reach climax because... And I'd be like, get in the body. No, I don't want to be there and all of this stuff. And I had to recognise there was actually a refusal within me to climax in this situation. And I was fighting that refusal all of the time. Now, that was really crucial for me to realise, no, I'm actually using my will against... I think I want this, but... But the refusal comes from these things. I'm avoiding my feelings of sexual unworthiness. I'm avoiding masses of shame within me. I'm avoiding the terror of giving my heart, of being sexually harmed, all of these things. I want control. I'm angry. In fact, no, I'm really pissed off. <laughs> that w and then is the refusal. Now, I felt like I want to join with this person. I want to have pleasure. I want to pleasure him, all of these things. But because I was in denial of all of these things, it created a refusal in my body. And while I was, like, I was happy to feel all this frustration, it doesn't work, babe, I really want it to work, oh, no, 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 I'm just bad, oh, my body doesn't work, I hate everything. That was all a big effect of me avoiding, I refuse, I refuse. This is really self-deception, really. yeah. Does that make sense? For Mary, it was yes. mostly self-deception because she didn't want to feel how angry with me she is. No, it makes the refusal, like, it clicked. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, cool. okay, I'm that not... It clicked with me I'm not going to yeah. give that pleasure or... I'm not going to give mine. this part of myself I'm, I'm holding it, it's yeah. mine. And so most women so. are quite angry with men. And unless they're able to transmit that anger freely, they won't reach orgasm. Now, unfortunately, a lot of women nowadays transmit that anger freely even during sex and the man, many of the men are willing to receive it because they can also enjoy themselves with the sex. And so, unfortunately, what happens is the women only orgasm when they're in this state where they're taking control, you know, doing all the, staying in this area. What I'm suggesting to you is that when you try to release that area, you won't orgasm anymore, <laughs> basically. And, and, and that's because we're now starting to get into the emotion of what's really there. So what I'm saying is that sometimes women who are angry will certainly be able to orgasm regularly, but, but only because the male will accept that anger and therefore there's a transmission or a flow of information, a flow of energy, energy. Yeah. 
emotional energy from the female to the male, where the male's absorbing the anger and going, and, and, and basically both of them now can actually reach orgasm. But if the male stops absorbing the anger, then the woman's no longer attracted to him, mm. and so she won't feel sexually attracted to him. But for myself, I, orgasm was never easy. It hardly ever happened. It was always a marathon. It was always... Right. <laughs> Nicole's giggling about my marathon. But, um, but it, <laughs> it, it wasn't until I started to get real about these things that things like freed up. I was like, oh, this is totally different. But I'm still, because I'm still working through these things, it still waxes and wanes. You know. So we could like make love for an hour and nothing, Mary doesn't go beyond a certain point. But then we just stop and we say, and I, usually I feel like, Ma Mary, you're fairly angry. Like, you're really frustrated and angry. And, and when Mary goes then into her anger and rage, sometimes she'll rage uh, or be angry and then get into a lot of grief about how she feels about me. So that might take a few, few hours or so. And then if we come together after that, you know, five minutes later, <laughs> it's all happened sort of thing, yeah. you know. So it can be that much difference between... Between right. I, di I didn't believe it was possible for me to orgasm this easily. And I really thought it was a physical dysfunction <laughs> until I started dealing with these things. And then I was like, oh, this, and you'll get more confidence and faith back in this process yeah. once you get real about the refusal. So as I see it, then the problem is because it's difficult to accept that at the time we have to actually stop, let it go, no matter who's more aroused and who or who wants it more. Yep. And like, just either get angry or feel get real shameful, about it, yeah. or, but just completely stop it and not just say, "Well, okay, yeah. well, you go ahead, and then like we'll forget it." Or yeah. yeah. Well, what happens and for us now too is that if I feel any contrary emotion from Mary at all, I just lose my erection immediately anyway. So it's not possible for us to continue sexually until the emotional issue is resolved. Mm. When the emotional issue is resolved, then it's totally different. We can stay at it uh, most of the day if we wanted to, uh, if the emotional issues are resolved. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. But um, don't just wait for sexual uh, experiences to start to challenge these emotions. Like, um, it's, I found it, it's now that I'm really starting to focus on them all of the time. How do I feel about my own body, my own vagina? How do I feel about my soulmate? How do I feel about men? All of the time looking at those. And it's starting to happen for you, I know, like dreams. Yeah, yeah, are, yeah. 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 Really yeah. explicit and shameful. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, and the same thing for me. And if you can take those opportunities, then the actual sexual act becomes immediately much more relaxed and sometimes you still have to stop, but sometimes... It, it works much more lovely in a yeah. lovely way. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. yeah, and also um, don't forget the sexual connection is not just about sex either. It's about what happens all day, every day between the two of you. And see what what often happens. We notice in a lot of relationships is there's almost total disconnection, disconnection. all day, most of the day. Um, and then they come together to have sex, and then wonder why there's disconnection or a feeling of disconnection. The, re the reality is that a sexual union occurs all day, every day, when it's in its pure state. Um, and physically you come together whenever you want the opportunity. But, but you are constantly feeling desire and passion for the other person. So any time you're not feeling desire and passion for the other person, the key is to stop and feel about that. For me, uh, it always usually relates to my grief with, with women and my feelings of rejection. Uh, about women that caused me to feel like, oh, you know, I, I want to spend time alone away from Mary or whatever. For Mary, it's different emotions. Lots of things. And even just like, whoa, this is like enough connection now. I want to go and hide in that little shell of myself and just like have... I, I, when I met AJ, I was so used to like keeping everything... Guarded. Guarded inside of me. I didn't want to share all of me because I thought it was so yucky and unlovable, you know. And... Um, but then other issues might cause me to withdraw, like grief, rage, shame, anything that I don't want to Sometimes be with, spirit, with him. Sometimes spirits yeah. cause it, you know, yeah. due to the connection with spirits. So, for example, um, like we, we found that when Mary was around other angry women, she would treat me in a totally different way than when we were by ourselves. 
and so we had to work through that issue together, you know, like I had to The bring feeling it up of I want mum's love and I want mum's approval and I'm afraid of mum's anger was stronger than I want to connect with my soulmate. And, and if, until and I if I the women around are all angry with men, then the only way for me to get mum's approval or is this to women, side is with to them. be angry with men. Yeah. And so she'd be angry with me. Yeah. Does that make sense? Or distant. Yeah, yeah and then the thing that uh, happens is, so I have all this stuff and I recognize it for myself. And maybe I'm not always open about this is what it is. And then Arthur feels that I am controlling him with this. So he says, if I, if I want this every day and we only have sex when you feel like it, then I feel, why do I have to give it to you? And then he gets angry about that. Can I talk about it from the male's perspective for a bit? Yeah, because yeah. this is something that um, I feel a lot of men don't get to voice what's really going on with their, in their relationships at all, sexually. They uh, often get ignored with everything. Everything gets sort of focused upon the woman and her orgasm and everything else. And, and the, uh, oftentimes there's very, very little discussion about how the men feel when these problems occur. Now, w when Mary goes into rage, anger and control... Um, my feelings um, are totally uh, around, surrounding th these kind of things. It's, uh, it feels to me like, no, now I'm just being used. I'm just sort of having to be a machine, you know, like I don't have any feelings. I just have to be a machine that lasts longer than she does, you know. Um, I have to um, perform, otherwise, you know, I'm not, you know, cons considered any other time if I don't perform sexually and so forth. And, and you have to suppress your desire. And I have to suppress my desire if, I don't have one. if Mary doesn't have one. Now, I had to come to the right. point of recognising, oh, if I'm the one without the desire and we're in a relationship, maybe I've got the issue. His, demand, his desire feels like a demand, but maybe it's just a desire and I have a lot of anger <laughs> that, and refusal to soften and actually be in a state of desire with my partner all of the time. So from a male's perspective, I'd be going, I'd be going, but Mary, like I desire you all the time because I love you all the time and I'm not angry with you all the time and I don't feel, you know, like I want to control you any, or any of those kind of feelings. I just love you and so therefore I desire Mary, I desire her body, I desire to interact with her, even like, unlike some men or many men, I want to interact with her emotionally. Uh, as well as physically, you know, and sexually, but uh, but all forms of interaction, spiritually as well. Yeah, but it's not to say that you have sex when you don't desire it, because mm. that is so not yucky. suggesting that, that is creating more lie in your body. Yeah. it's to look at if I don't have a desire. Why not? Why don't I? What's there's got to be something wrong, doesn't it? If you love somebody and sex is a pleasurable act, and you love somebody, then then surely desire would be present quite frequently unless there's some alternative thing going on. And the problem is that many don't see that. They just go, no, he's being demanding or he's being this. And in, their, in the woman's anger towards the male, she's, which she's acting out about past anger, really, like anger towards her father, anger towards men multi-generationally, usually that's the source of this anger. She's acting out with the current partner, sort of, and in the end, he becomes... If this continues without being resolved and he stays in the relationship, he becomes more and more and more resentful and eventually becomes one of those men that she's complaining about, right? even though he might have started in a different state. And, uh, and this is the problem with these kind of interactions if we don't resolve them and discuss them and then work through them as a priority. We find a lot of people in relationships don't work through these issues as a priority. They sort of put these things on the back burner, you know, and they deal with it once a week or whatever. Yeah, and know? because these things, sexual fear and shame are pretty, um, they're pretty buried in a lot of women. It feels very confronting to go there. And for me, I was happy to deal with any other emotion except, like, could we not deal with those ones? But in fact, it's the thing that is affecting our relationship on a day-to-day -day basis, our closeness, our intimacy. And I had, to, I had to really look at, well, where is my desire? How much do I really value this person? Maybe he does have a point that if he desires me and I'm always shutting him down, maybe that's just as controlling as I'm accusing, you know, as, as I feel I have been controlling in other relationships. Can I also point out that um, when this interaction occurs, um, there's this feeling that often goes on where, we've, where the male feels the female's refusal and then basically feels like their entire desire 
for the woman, it almost feels pointless being in love with her, if that makes sense, to the male. Like, there's no point in being in love with her. I'm not allowed to interact with her body. I'm not, now, I'm not interacting with her emotionally because of her fear and shame either. And that, but I love her and I have this strong desire to interact. And then there's this feeling of almost pointlessness that overwhelms the male. I'm better off not being in a relationship if that's the case. Like, and, and there's been some times in our relationship where I've felt Mary's refusal so strongly in terms of as an emotion. It wasn't verbalised, like Mary wouldn't say, I don't like you, <laughs> you know, and all that. But there's just this refusal to even have any concept of a desire even for me. And I'd go, well, darling, if you don't desire me, then I'd prefer to not be in a relationship with you. Because the reality is living in a relationship where you desire somebody and they don't desire you feels quite hurtful. <laughs> you, you actually feel better off not in the relationship. And, and, uh, and unless the person who has the lack of desire is willing to look at the lack of desire, then, then basically you're not going to grow in the relationship. You're never going to reach that union state together where you're actually joining. Does that make sense? And so one or both of the parties need to look at their emotions and involved. It's also like in other partnerships, perhaps there's a lack of, as we talked a bit about yesterday, there's a lack of desire perhaps in the woman because of... Uh, an, an error-based emotion coming from the man. So both parties need, need to, look. to look at their stuff. Okay, there's a lack of desire. Is that an injury in me? Am I avoiding a can lot I, of things? Can I give an it? example of yep. that? Let's say I expect Mary all day, every day, to care for the kids, care for the washing, care for the ironing, care for the food, plus she has to go to work as well because we want some extra money in the family and she's got to do all these other things. I come home, I relax, she comes home, she's still working. Now... You imagine months and months of that, months of that, or years of that, even. Eventually, what's what's Mary going to feel? She's going to feel very resentful, tired, tired exhausted, feeling very sexually open to you. Not I'm very sexually open at, at all, because <laughs> yeah. she's tired probably as yeah. well. She'd be actually quite angry with me, even though that anger might be hidden. You know, quite suppressed. She would be quite angry with me. That is definitely going to suppress her passion and desire, right? So if I'm going, what's the problem? with your passion and desire at, at Mary and Mary starts to voice to me like, oh, well, you know, this I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this. No, it's nothing to do with it's that. It's about like, sex. It's, this yeah. is about sex. Yeah. Um, then what I'm doing is ignoring how I'm treating Mary and I'm really the creator of Mary's lack of desire. Does that make sense? And I've got to look at that as the male. Why, why would I want to do that? If I really love this woman, wouldn't I want our relationship to have an equal burden of responsibility or not? You know, wouldn't I want that? And, and so what I've got to do is look at how I have affected her lack of desire. Does that make sense? Yeah. For me, though, for in our relationship, it was much more about me wanting to justify my fear and shame. <coughs> it's too hard. I can't do it. You, can't, you don't know how bad it is for me. I'm staying in refusal, you know, and I had to look at that. So yeah. Mary would be saying to me that her fear was too great to handle. It was too hard. Or she'd be going, I'm just, like, she'd go, I'm, I feel overwhelmed. Yeah. I can't go any further. You know, like those kind of statements. They're all statements that indicate you're refusing to go there, right? You're not embracing the process of dealing with your emotion, you're refusing it. And so we've had to work through that issue together of why is there this refusal? What are, your, what are Mary's belief systems about emotion even? Yeah. And, and one of the emotional beliefs that she picked up very young due to her family influences was that uh, emotion is, it always gets hugged out of you. So you, you never, don't have to, go through you don't have to feel it, it just is going to get hugged out of you by somebody else. Does that make sense? So there's this belief in the family that, that you know... You shouldn't go through emotions. You don't have you to go hug. through <laughs> You just need a hug and everything will be fine. And, and that causes a lot of shutdown emotionally. It causes a lot of disclaiming of personal responsibility for and the And it also eroded my confidence in being able to experience my emotions. So she got to the point where she didn't even believe she could do it mm. and feel it without, without overloading herself in some way emotionally. And so she's had to work through those belief systems uh, to get to the actual emotions. Yeah, the problem with us was kind of the opposite. We never talk about sex. I, I didn't learn from my mom, and she had the worst experience ever. So it was always something really, really bad. Mm. Yeah. yeah. 
So um, the key is to continue the discussion, place a priority on dealing with these emotions. Anything that prevents the joining of a couple is going to have a terrible effect on their lives in the long run and a terrible effect on their family on the long run. So, so anything, both male and female, that prevents the proper joining in equality needs to be addressed emotionally. So it's not about blaming each other, but it's about addressing the issues in truth, becoming more truthful and honest and open with each other about those particular things. And Kat, it's so rewarding, honestly. I didn't think it would be, but it's really... It's Look, well, Thank Mary you. sort of had a belief, didn't you, darling, that, you, you know, that your body just didn't work and that was the way it is, basically. Yeah, and I was stuck in frustration. I felt it was pointless, you know, until I got to this light, light bulb, ah, oh, I need to start here, yeah. And for yeah. us, it's still not perfect. This did it. Yeah. yeah, and for us, it's still not perfect. No. But but Mary now can enjoy orgasm three or four times in a row if she wants to, and so forth. And so it's it's much much better than it than it used to be. And also, I can feel Mary a lot more. Like I can I'm feel she's body, yeah. she's allowing the touch into her to to touch her soul. Whereas before, when I would touch Mary, I just felt like there was no allowance of any touch into her soul, you know, like... It was and just I sort of had this feeling like I have to, like, I have to put out, basically. It's, uh, there's sort of a man's allowed to have sex and, you know, I just, you know, it's really like lie back, think of England, kind of. <laughs> it wasn't quite that bad, but it was almost, you know, <laughs> like there was that injury in me, like you got to do this and I don't really get much from it and it was yucky. Yeah. So in past relationships yeah. you've felt quite pressured, didn't you? Of yeah, yep. But it's, I kind of had the injury that it's a, it's a normal part of the relationship, you should do it, but I wasn't ever involved in it. And so it's, that's, that's very, yeah. 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 Does that yeah. answer things there? Is there any more questions associated with that? or um, If we go across to yeah. Simon and then yeah. down. Hey brother, um, it seems like you work through a lot of stuff, but I feel like there's a huge thing for men with the pressure stuff and to please the women. Um, particularly for uh, the younger generation. At the younger generation. The older like, generation yeah. has almost the opposite emotion. Yeah. So yeah. it's very interesting when you talk to um, different generations of men. Because different generations of men certainly have different attitudes towards their... Yeah. Towards well, the, their and the women have different attitudes, don't they? That yeah. You feel yeah. that, Simon? Like there's a lot of yeah. pressure to please. Is in that the, in the younger women... Yeah, it's a lot of... And in the you younger women of your generation, sort of in, in, the tw in the under 30s bracket, shall we say, down into even under 20s, there, there is now quite Great. a lot of demand and expectation. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you yeah. watch a porn or something like this, they're doing it like for ages... And you feel like, holy shit, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, I can't do that, so I'm, I'm <laughs> gone already, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and that's how a lot of young men actually get their sexual education, unfortunately, yeah. as well. They, you know, they don't learn much in a, any other way. And then they meet a girl who's quite demanding sexually and who's expressing a lot of rage sexually. The wo that particular girl will only be able to, cli to, uh, to climax or orgasm by projecting the rage during the sex act. So unless you can maintain an, an erection while you're getting rage at, uh, at you, uh, it's going to be a very unfulfilling, <laughs> unfulfilling for the male, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, for, for many of the young men, I feel there's a lot of confusion as a result of that. And then... That unfortunately, a lot of the men then respond very negatively by becoming uh, attacking and abusive or, yeah. or, or rageful themselves. And the, the attitude is more going like, oh, I'm the best one and I can have everything. Exactly. Every, yeah. exactly. And so the, ma the male who has that attitude can maintain his erection during the anger and doesn't really even really care what he's feeling from the woman. And it's not really an act of love anymore. It's just a sexual engagement. Yeah. So yeah. what are the causal emotions... For the younger brothers. Young, younger men? Yeah, for the younger men. Um, I feel a lot, of the, a lot of younger men have this real... You, you see it a lot in the young generation now, this real uh, feeling that they can expect to get anything they want whenever they want it. It's a very, very strong emotion in a lot of young men. So you have basically young men are polarised sexually. You have the young men who have become pleasers of the wangry woman, who basically just yeah. p 
panda, 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 to, you know, in other words, please, please her, please her some more, please her some more, please her some more. It's me, yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> so, so that group of emotions is all about needing the woman in order to feel validated as a male and needing the woman to actually uh, see you as important or see you as having value before you have a feeling of value yourself. And then there's another group of young men who basically have the opposite emotion. Many of the young men in Greece have this emotion of, I'm, I'm just a wonderful man. And, uh, and that comes from often being treated like that from their mothers. Like, you know, that they're just a wonderful man. Mummy, mum will do anything for them because they're just a wonderful man. And, and they come out with this attitude of real strong sexual arrogance. And as a result of that, they just feel every woman should just fall over backwards for them, you know, like. Um, and many of the women do, ironically, because of their own injuries, um, do, do that. And so that e emotion inside of them grows. So, so not everyone's the same, obviously, and, and we have different emotions in our family that create the different injuries we have sexually. So that's the thing, key, key, key thing to remember. So if you're the kind of man who pleases, 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 even though you're getting rage, then the key is to look at why am I pleasing this angry woman who's just projecting rage at me? And if you're the kind of man who's just arrogant, thinks he's pretty good and should get as much sex as he wants whenever he wants with whomever he wants, then there's a lot of unloving emotions from coming from that perspective that are revolving around how your mother in particular and how your father viewed men and how important men are. So, um, and in a lot of cultures, men are still more important than women, and so many of the men have this sexual arrogance as a result. Yeah, I feel like um, God is a really important part in it as well. Like, if you focus on God, like, for myself, a lot of things, like, seems to just to be worked through for myself. That's very true. Um, however... Um, Unless we're willing to face the, particularly for you and I, we have the same injury, uh, unless we're willing to face the, how disconnected we feel from the feminine side of God, we will not heal these sexual injuries. So we are, you know, many men on the planet, well, the, most of the planet's disconnected from femininity, as I've stated before, but many men on the planet are very disconnected and have resulted uh, from femininity, and that's resulted in men polarising. There's the kind of men who now view themselves to be dominant over femininity, and therefore they wish to just... They're basically the oppressors of femininity. And then there's the kind of men who pander to femininity, you know, who, who want to please femininity all the time. Well, it's not even femininity, is it? It's, it's a desire not, yeah. to please women in order to feel... The, in order to avoid the feeling of the loss of feminine love, yeah. and that's the that's the thing to focus on, Simon. I reckon is the, the grief about feminine love. Yeah. The grief. Yep. The truth and is that yep. it's very, very hard. Um, any person on the planet is very, very hard at the moment to feel loved by a woman. Whether you're, and I'm sorry for mothers. I know many mothers believe that their love is the strongest for their children, but I put to you that most mothers who actually believe that actually have very strong control of their children. And if you look at the relationships and the damage that it does to the children, you'll see the control coming out sooner or later. The reality is that, uh, unfortunately, true femininity is still not being uh, demonstrated on the planet. It's something we hope to see demonstrated on the planet, uh, you know, shortly. And I, I hope many of you will be part of demonstrating that on the planet. Um, but to your correct, Simon, in that you've got to connect to the feminine side of God in order to do that. And the, the problem is that very, very few people even recognise the feminine side of God, let alone connect to her. Yeah, yeah when, you, when you asked yesterday the question, and the question of, like, what questions do we have to God? Mm. And I just felt like, the fe I just asked, the, w w how are, um, like, not connecting to my mother at all? felt yes. really disconnection and then the tears came out like yeah. but there's huge grief yeah I, I have some very large grief about it and uh, and I'm still working way through it uh, now you know as we as we're talking about this and and I feel it's going to take some time yet before I resolve the issue because I just can feel the amount of grief that I have about the loss of the that connection with God and the loss of that connection with my soulmate in that pure state um, so I have quite a lot of grief about it but I think most people on the planet do have quite a lot of grief about it and when I talk about the femininity I'm not talking about the earth goddess 
you know, the new age goddesses, you know, like I, I put to you that uh, many of the people who view themselves as new age goddesses are actually enraged with males. And in fact, in fact, you very rarely hear of men on earth calling themselves gods, but you do hear of many women being called or calling themselves goddesses. And, uh, and that is a sort of a, a, it's almost a kickback to the damage that the women have received. And then now they're in rage, anger and control about it, trying to, trying to tell themselves that they're goddesses when the reality is they still don't really feel that inside of themselves. So uh, there are a lot of healing things that need to occur between the masculine and the feminine. And, uh, and the reality is that as we get closer to God, we will also heal the different injuries we have towards the masculine or towards the feminine, depending on what gender we are. And, uh, and while we refuse to heal them, we are in anger, not in any other emotion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's the thing we need to remember. Thanks a lot. Yeah. If we come down to Eva, if we can. Uh, yes. Uh, I would uh, love to hear some about the emotions with uh, losing the erection and what part I may play in that as a woman. Yep, yep, certainly. Um, the biggest <laughs> effect on me um, as a male, it, it, it requires, the more sensitive a male becomes to the woman's emotion, it will actually dictate his sexual response to the woman. See, most men on the planet historically have not been very connected to the woman's emotion. So in other words, the woman is almost like a possession. In the past, this is particularly the case. In multi-generations in the past, women were just possessions. So basically, from a male's perspective in the past, a woman was just a sex doll, really, right? and a baby production system, and a cooker, a cooker and a cleaner and a washer-upper and all of those kind of things. That's how the, many men treated their women. Now, of course, as a result of that, many women multi-generationally have a lot of anger about being treated this way. And even if you personally weren't treated that way, it's a high likelihood your parent or your grandparent or, you know, your mother or your grandmother or her grandmother was treated that way. And, uh, and because of the way, you know, it's only very recently that women have felt empowered. In fact, it's only very recently that women are even given a vote, let's face it let alone any other form of control over their life. And still in many countries, they're not given a vote, they're not allowed to buy property, they're not allowed to do so many things. So there is this multi-generational thing that is still being perpetuated today. So the woman's emotions then get quite intense. Now, if I'm a male who is sensitive to her emotions, then what I'm going to feel is the barrage of those emotions aimed at myself because I'm a man. Now, in Mary's case, um, I feel it not only because I'm a man, but because Mary has anger and rage about my death in the first century and my choices that I made in the first century that are in her now. Does that make sense? Now, as a result of that, when we come together, if any of those emotions are unfelt within Mary, in other words, she's not connecting to them, she's, trying, them. she's trying to suppress them, she will actually be pro projecting them. They'll be, they'll be pushed out of her towards myself. Now as soon as I feel those emotions, because I'm sensitive to her feelings, I immediately lose my erection as a result. Does that make sense? Now there's another way that impotence is an issue. Isn't yeah, it? well, so I, this is one way, so I'll just, this is one way. There is another <laughs> way that is, an in, that is an issue as well. So in, in that place, I cannot engage with Mary sexually. We have to stop and discuss, and what we do is then is we discuss the emotions that I'm feeling from her and my response to them. So my response to them is to sort of go into my shell, you know, to, to say, oh, this barrage coming from you is too much for me to handle. I feel totally unloved and unwanted. I don't feel like I'm desired. And I just, and because my, um, this, because of some of the injuries I have about that, I, I just go into my shell with it. And I, I talk about it with Mary, of course, but we have to resolve both of the emotions. So Mary needs to look at her rage and anger and I need to look at my response to her rage and anger. 
It's also about love and will in in your in, in your case. You can feel that my will is not actually to have sex because I'm projecting these yeah. things. And so you respond quite uh, sensitively to that. Yeah. As soon as I feel from Mary that she is not interested in having sex, then I will instantly lose an erection anyway. Mm. So as soon as I feel from her, she's not interested. Does that make sense? Um, and the reasons for her lack of interest may be many fold. It might be she's being harmed by spirits at the time or she might be being in self-blame at the time. You know, she's feeling self-punishing at the time or she might have some of these emotions that she's not allowing herself to feel. Even if I get triggered in fear or shame, um, that's not even related. But it just comes up as a result of my something in my body being triggered through the act yeah. then you immediately I immediately have yeah. to stop yeah. like, and what I do then is just let Mary work through that emotion and once Mary's worked through the emotion I can feel it, and my body responds even to her working through the emotion so if Mary works through the emotion while we're laying in bed together eventually I'll get an erection again without even touching her like does that make sense like it, it because of the sensitivity to her, her emotion now um that's one reason for why a man may, may lose his erection. May, he may be very sensitive to the emotion and therefore you know, be able to respond to in that way, which I feel is actually quite a loving way in the sense that uh, why would you want to have sex with a person who doesn't feel a, or feels a lack of desire? Or why would you want to have sex when the will of the other person isn't involved? Why would you want to have sex you know, if they feel angry towards you and those kind of things? For many men, though, uh, impotence is actually, or losing of their erection, is actually more about rage. Uh, and for many men, the speed of their orgasm is more about rage than it is about sensitivity to the woman's emotion. So Do you understand what I mean by that? Yeah, that it had, could have something to do with their... Uh, they don't want to please the woman yes. to that extent any longer. Yes, that's correct. Yes. Uh, so many men want to have the orgasm and get over and done with and then not please the woman any longer than that. They don't want to touch the woman after that. They feel even maybe ashamed of the woman after that. There might be many childhood emotions involved in that. You know how I was talking about the refusal of my body to orgasm was about suppression of all of these things. For many men... Uh, so if we it, talk about the man's refusal... Yeah, to he might ejaculate quickly or lose his erection. Yeah. It is very it's commonly be about... similar about emotions. The huge suppression of many emotions on his behalf. Mm. So it's a very similar dynamic. Yeah. Yep. But what I suggest to all men is when they become sensitive completely to the will and desire of each person in the relationship, then of course the erection will be very dependent, even the maintenance of it in terms of period of time, will be very sensitive to the emotional flow between the two of you. So it's less dependent on... Anything, well, now for us, it's le it doesn't depend on anything else, mm -hmm. right? For me, so so it doesn't matter how sexy Mary looks. It doesn't matter how you know. Uh, oh, she looks gorgeous most of the time, but uh, when I say most no. of the time, all, I feel all the time. Um, but uh, it, so it doesn't. But it doesn't depend upon that. It doesn't depend upon any of those things. But it does depend a lot upon my feelings. I've had times when I've lost my erection because of my own feelings about mm -hmm. myself but I've also had times when I can just feel Mary's feelings towards me and I go, that's not, you know, while I have a desire, then my body shows me that, no, the desire is, is not there anymore. Yeah. yeah, so the more pure we become, the more it's based on this, the flow of energy and emotions between us. Initially, when we start working on these issues, like for me, most of these issues were not related to any, there was no flow and I was in suppression of a lot of that, which was blocking our flow, was going out of body. And, and Mary I was getting into self-blame a lot yeah. too, like blaming her body, yeah. saying my body's yeah. just useless yeah. and getting angry with the body. And I just try to help Mary get out of the anger with herself and into the fact that, no, the body's perfect. There's got to be just emotions. Yeah, so that yeah. created the refusal. And for many men, it's the, the impotence of the ejaculation quickly is usually about a lot of this stuff suppressed from their past or from the history of the relationship. Mm. So it's, it's not related to that flow. Yeah. 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 So um, does that answer your question, Eva, a bit more yeah. detail? And Eva, if you were asking, you asked about your part in that, what, <laughs> why your part might be, 
very often this these sort of issues for men can occur after they've been with a wo woman who yeah. for a long time projected a lot of rage and control and they that then triggers in them a lot of other feelings. So I would be looking f for me, if it was my partner in that situation, at my these feelings that I'm holding on to in myself. So, no, so what Mary's suggesting is if, if the woman has been in this state for a long, long time and unwilling to deal with that state for a long time... So in refusal, In say. refusal, then the man's feeling her refusal and after a while that feeling of refusal coming from her just builds up and builds up in the man and he gets to the point where he really no longer gives, a, gives any care, doesn't care at all about whether she orgasms or not, whether she receives any pleasure or not because he's just tired of the refusal well, to deal with the issues. Now. He's yeah. now in a rage. Yeah. And the, the way he acts that out is either through impotence or through, you know, a, a quick ejaculation and then just, you know, rolling over and going to sleep sort of thing. Um, in, or, in other words, using the woman for his own pleasure because that's now the only thing he feels is possible. And uh, the alternative to that is he goes off and cheats on her. You know, goes off and has a relationship with a woman who's more responsive, in other words. Mm. And, uh, and that happens quite frequently. Uh, I don't feel that that is always the case because many times many men also have the injury that they should be able to have sex with lots of different women and it's a normal thing and that's a whole different set of injuries. Yeah. So don't, don't feel that what we're describing here is a complete set of the injuries that are possible in, in any partnership because no. it's not. Thank you. Um, now, we had, we had the three down, down the front. front who had their hands up. So let's go. Do you go. want to keep... Is there more about sex? No. Is there, Nina, a, just is there a more about sex with any others? Yes. So let's, yep. let's do the others first then. Let's go across to Michael uh, first. And then we'll come across to Nina and then up the back to Nico. So... Uh, Michael. Michael. Yep. Yep. I'm... I'm wondering if I could have been confused or in the dark about sex a lot because I'm, I'm a pleaser and I cared very much about pleasing my girl mm -hmm. and she is well pleased, you know, yep. multiple organisms. And yep. but the, but but I, can I put to you, yes, all the women you've been um, engaged with have all had huge amounts of rage. And I haven't felt that, so... I know. Which is what is issue. my responsibility? <laughs> exactly. See, what, what's happening is they have huge amounts of rage which they are able to act out in the sexual act. That's why they're orgasming frequently. And unfortunately, during, if they have huge amounts of rage, there's a high likelihood too that they're also being affected by spirits who are also affecting their sexual response. And so actually you're engaging with not just the woman but often many spirits with the woman who want to share in her sexual response. And, uh, and, and you, because you are so desensitised to a woman's anger, you just feel it's normal that a woman's angry with you. And in fact, you've become so desensitised that you don't even feel it as anger anymore. Right. That's how desensitised you've become. You now are the absorption of this consistent stream of rage while, during the sex act. And of course, that's going to turn the woman on and therefore she'll be quite pleased. Because she can live in control then. Do you get that? Like she She's the person living in anger, rage and control. She's got spirits with her living in the same place, heightening her sexual response because they're all enjoying the fact that they have control of this situation. They have, they have the upper hand in this situation, if you could call it that. And as a result of that, um, you are really, and you're not even aware of it, being quite denigrated and, and pushed around. And because it's sex, there's this willingness to overlook it. Does that make sense? Because yes. you receive some pleasure in the process and therefore there's a strong willingness to overlook how badly you're getting treated. And this is what's happening in your particular situation. Now, the key is to allow yourself to become more sensitive to the rage and anger in the person. Right? And then, ask, then, then you've got to allow yourself to see actually that rage and anger being projected at you is undeserved. You know, you don't deserve this rage and anger. Other men may have treated her badly that do deserve such rage and anger, perhaps. But even then, I would argue that if a person wants to love, then they want to heal that too. But uh, you certainly don't deserve this rage and anger. And, uh, and this is why you often feel quite uh, um, dissatisfied in the relationship. Not sexually dissatisfied, 
but actually dissatisfied emotionally. Uh, because the reality is you're receiving huge amounts of very negative projections in order to satisfy the woman. Mm. Does that make sense, Michael? Yes. Yeah. And I, but I would look at the barter you're willing to have. Yep. There's huge feelings of uh, unworthiness that translate into neediness with women. So you're happy to have that placated, um, like you're happy to receive the anger as long as they placate that emotion within yeah. you. So yeah. there's your responsibility. Okay, what am I not feeling for myself, which is how badly I feel about myself in relation to women. In other words, you're willing to receive the... It even gets more specific than what Mary said, I feel for yourself. You're willing to receive the anger as long as you have sex. And sex is your method of getting approval as a male. Does that make sense? So your method of getting approval is the sex. And as long as you receive sex, you're willing to have the female's anger for as long as, you want, as long as she wants to send it to you. And of course, the women you then attract are all going to only be able to orgasm in a rage. In other words, they are, during the process of their sexual uh, process, most of the time they are feeling feelings of rage and allowing those feelings of rage to enter you. Could they be unaware of their rage too and just be stepped out and so oh. someone else is there? Most, most probably. Because <laughs> when a person's in a rage, there are heavy spirit influences in that place. And so therefore, you know, she's just feeling... The reality is she's just feeling her own orgasmic state, not realising that her orgasmic state has been heightened by not only her own rage, but the rage of the spirits with her, who are then, who are then utilising her rage in order to feel sexual feelings. And uh, that's... a. Uh, in other words, she's not really participating in her own sexual experience. Mary in the first century had experience with this a lot, where she was in a rage with men and often acted out that rage and in a spirit-induced state. And, the, and most of the men accepted it because of the same feeling of sex is sex. So you get, you've got to be happy when you have it. You know? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Does that answer the... Yeah. Yeah. And that does define me most of your female relationships, doesn't it? Yeah, many of them are carrying around large amounts of rage, which they, do, which they do project at you at times other than sex, if you think about it. So. And I have difficulty getting to my grief, so I'm guessing that that's where I need to go. Well, yeah, there's this first... There's a belief, whole set of belief systems first, uh, Michael, that... that the belief system that uh, actually this is allowable is it, begin, it begins the problem, where you're allowing the woman who's angry to use you, and you've got to look at why you know would you normally be attracted to such an angry woman? Does that make sense? Like, so you've got to look at that, like the attraction you feel towards the the angry, the angry woman and resentful woman. And you've got to look at, uh, you know, why you feel so attracted to that angry, resentful woman. And partly, I feel, is because some spirits with you know that they will ha give you lots of sex as long as you please them. Th does that make sense? And your method of getting approval as a male is by the woman wanting sex with you. Do, do you follow me? Now, you're willing to overlook large amounts of rage in your day-to-day -day existence with her. You know, so she comes home angry, she's fitting chips most of the time. You're willing to overlook all of that as long as the sexual union seems to be consistent. And, uh, and that's the place to start, you know, the, the willingness to overlook poor behaviour just because you are getting some sexual feelings from her. Unfortunately, most of the women who, into, to, who, who um, have... Um, any, any form of interaction with you, most of them are in sexual rage and they know that you are the kind of person who will be able to allow that to come out during the sex act without it, without, and they, they know they're going to have some enjoyment of that. Mm. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, you want to say? Oh, uh, no, it's just a little round off, probably just about addictions, emotional addictions. Yeah. Um, like, before we even get to the grief that 
drives an emotional addiction, we have to first be willing to see the extent of the addiction. And that's basically what AJ's describing to you. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to see how big this is in your life, how much the barter occurs, how, what, see the extent of what's happening, and then connect to the damage that that is doing to you and to the other people involved. Really be willing to see those first two things because until you are, it's going to be very hard to get to the grief of what's actually, what you're actually avoiding of what's actually happened. Yeah. Because while we're not willing to see those things, we're not really willing to like open the windows and see really what's there. It's very hard to get deeper. We can go, oh, intellectually, this is grief about not feeling loved by mum. I just, but, but we're not willing to see just how big it is a, theme in our life, um, we're never fully going to release how much is actually there. That's yeah. my feeling anyway. Is that yeah, you and, agree with and that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, and what's happening for yourself is that you are um, staying in the addiction because it's a preferable state to feeling the grief that's, that's really within you about how you're being treated on a day-to-day -day basis. You are overlooking the treatment generally in preference to the treatment sexually and many men do do this because of our addiction to sex as a way of getting the feelings of sexual approval so that 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 that's one of the reasons why we do it and um, and we need to look at that as a because this is not an equal relationship now this is one person projecting huge amounts of rage through the sex act at the other person and it's very, very damaging for you to absorb it into yourself. But it's also damaging for the woman because she's becoming more and more connected to her sexual rage, living in her sexual rage, never releasing it, in fact. And unfortunately, in that state, becoming overcloaked with spirits during the sex act as well. So you're not only having sex with one person now, you're, you're basically having threesomes or more uh, every single time you're engaging sexually. And, and the other thing is that if you think about it on your day-to-day -day relationships, you have been very disappointed emotionally. You feel often quite misunderstood, quite unappreciated and so forth emotionally in these relationships, but because of the sex, stay in the relationship. And quite often you absorb quite a lot of anger that's not just sexual in the relationship, but you absorb that anger because of the sexual the sexual connection being strong, what you feel is strong. Also, one other thing I'd like to bring to your attention is that uh, w at least one of the women in your past have become lesbian after leaving you. And uh, that's a, my suggestion to you is to consider that's how much sexual rage they have towards the male. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's uh, something to just allow yourself to feel about. Yeah, it's good, Michael. Yeah. Um, is there any questions associated with what I just discussed with Michael? Yeah, perhaps we can come across to Anto and then. Dive. Could you just talk a bit more about the spirit influence at that time? Like, when does it actually stop? When you're in a sex act, when are you not influenced by spirits? Um, at what point do you reach? Um, Remember that our pure emotions are all loving, right? They're all lovingly based. All of our other emotions, which are like rage, anger, control, fear, shame, all of the emotions that eventually we need to release from us, they are all not based in love. They are based in other things. Now, now, whenever we are unable to actually feel the emotion and we're using the emotion, there's a difference between feeling the emotion and releasing it and using the emotion to maintain a state. So what happens is, like, when you get into a rage, all of you at some point in your life surely have been in a rage, right? When you get into a rage, in that place, there is a desire to maintain the state as long as possible, most of the time. Now, the reason for that is that we have no desire to get underneath that state and into the actual emotion we really do feel. And so the rage is the preferred power-based position. Now, while I am searching for power, and rage, anger and control are all forms of power that I'm searching for, while I am searching for power, not only am I avoiding more causal emotions of fear and shame and the underlying grief under those things, but not only, I am now in the state where 
many spirits are going to be attracted to express their emotions through me. Now, if the rage and anger and control feelings are revolving around the sexual acts, then during the sexual acts, I am going to definitely be overcloaked or engaged with spirit sexually. Now, that can only stop when I'm willing to actually own the rage and anger that I have inside of myself without having sex and actually express that and release that and then get underneath that to the fear and shame, the terrible terrors and shame that exist, that the avoidance of causes the rage of. Does that make sense? So while I'm heavily trying to shut myself down in this area, I will revert to this area. And when I revert to this area and live in it, now I am definitely going to attract many spirits around me who wish to engage those feelings with me. And the combination of sexual feelings along with those feelings is one of the most powerful motivators for spirits to never change their life and people on earth to never change their life. When sexual feelings are involved with those feelings, in other words, I can only orgasm or, or climax, I can only feel good when I feel those feelings, that is one of the most powerful ways in which spirits can affect us. So many men, for example, who become rapists or abusers are in this state. They are angry and also having sexual desires at the same time. And as a result of that, now they are in sexual rage and they can perpetrate all forms of violence in justification of this rage. For many women, they don't have the physical power to actually do that. So what they do is they engage a man who's willing to absorb all of that rage. And so they find a man like Michael, unfortunately, sorry about that, Michael. Um, and they find a man like Michael and project all that rage to him. And during that rage also can now orgasm. And in that place, many spirits are actually involved in the actual process. Right? The critical point is when we own it. You know, then, as you know, with other spirit influence, it's very, a spirit cannot, it's only when we want to live in the state project the state, suppress the state that spirits can hook in. As soon as I own I'm angry and it's my feeling, it's not your fault, it's my feeling, spirits can't be, they can't maintain the connection. Yeah. So that's why when myself and Mary are together, whenever Mary feels that anger, whether it's towards me or other men uh, in the past that she's, ha that she's been involved with, I mean in the first century past, then the, the she has a lot of rage towards because of how damaging they were towards her then I, we just stop straight away and I just encourage Mary to just go into this rage, just go into the rage and, and the rage might last 20 minutes or half an hour or an hour or whatever. Just allow the going into the rage. While you're in your personal rage, now spirits can't, while you're actually feeling the emotions related to that rage, spirits can now not affect you with their rage. It's your denial of your personal rage that causes spirits to be able to greatly influence you in that state and connect with you sexually and so forth. And before you know it, before you know it, many even have heightened sexual experiences in that state. So they actually tell themselves they're even more connected than they normally are when the reality is, remember I described yesterday how when an emotional flow occurs outside of me, how now the sexual feelings through me can pass. They have, they're not blocked anymore. So if I have a deep injury of sexual rage and I find somebody who has no sexual rage but in fact the opposite emotion of absorption of sexual rage, now there's a connection. Now my sexy feelings will be very strong. And then if I'm in the rage, I've got spirits with me enhancing those feelings because I'm allowing the flow of those feelings in that state. Now the spirits with me can enhance those feelings even stronger. And before I know it, I'm just like a mo sexual monster, really, in a lot of ways, projecting all of this up. And I'm enjoying myself. It doesn't mean that uh, the other person is. But this person may be enjoying and they themselves. May be if they have they a lot of shame, then they feel I'm sexually disgusted. Or they have a lot of sexual unworthiness. Yep. They'll absorb all they'll that and feel quite in. turned on as well in the process. Yep. So it will feel great to both people, but the reality is it's not loving. So whilst we're growing in, like, for example, when we've felt certain emotions and then we have a desire for each other and we go into an act, mm -hmm. even though we've still got all those other emotions we haven't dealt with, we're still allowing the, I guess, during the act itself, we're still allowing other spirits to come in because of that. 
other set of emotions. It's the shutdown of those emotions that allow the other spirits to come. So, so there's various so degrees. Of when you're yeah. in full engagement, you're not now allowing spirits very well at all. In fact, you don't, they, they can't. You don't have in. to be completely healed yeah. to have to have no spirit influence. You just have to be completely in your body and in your experience. So you can come together. You can deal with some emotions and come together in a pure desire or a desire that's based fairly purely mm. um, and stay connected with each other and your body in that state and no spirit can be involved. It's when, if you're in that act, something gets triggered for one of you and you suppress it, then you open it. Can I draw to your attention too, Anto, that, that um, spirits who do this are all in the hells or in a condition of the hells. So if, you're, if you together are in a second sphere condition, they already are going to be very uncomfortable around you, no matter what emotions you feel. I mean, when we started this path, we actually had experiences where we realised it wasn't actually us. Exactly. We were involved in an act. We totally overclosed. We woke up and realised we were actually having sex and it's not, yeah. we weren't aware of it. Yeah. But now things are slightly changing. So yep. I was just wondering about... And as your condition grows, so once you get to a, about a third sphere condition together and in that place you're in total truth with each other and you have no longer any fear dominance in your, in your entire life. So in other words, truth always dominates your entire life. So you'd never engage anybody in a fearful way. In that state, it's very, very hard for any spirit now to influence uh, the sex act between the two of you. Because most spirits who could do so would be in the hills and to even be in your presence, they feel is uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so, so that disconnects you almost completely. Can I, just, can I just can I just say there yeah. is some huge <laughs> I'm shaking huge, since we sta since you started speaking to the men the men have started asking questions and you address some of the masculine emotions the whole and I don't know if anyone else can feel that the whole energy has dropped and there is a lot of rage being projected at me right now so um, there's obviously some spirits here I'm just going to love them um, because they're feeling a bit challenged about loving men. So. They're women spirits. They are. Yeah. Affecting yep. many of the women in the audience now. Um, and yes, you know, the, the uh, challenge is to heal these intergender emotional injuries. The fact, uh, many of you women who are hearing this stuff when we talk about men, if you're finding yourself getting tired or finding yourself sort of just a bit, fla you know, feeling like exhausted all of a sudden, that is the amount of women's spirit influence you are under to not know anything about a man's emotion. So that, uh, it's quite, it can be quite Many intense. of us, and I, I used to be in this state, feel there's so much damage being done to women and being done to me, that has been done to me, that to even hear about a man's experience or a man's pain made me It felt angry. like a betrayal. It felt like, hey, but what about me? Yeah, you know, my pain is paramount, it's more, and the justification of my fear and all of those things made me very resistive to, to hearing even about a man's experience and how, how it, you know, I think it's beautiful that the men are opening up and sharing their experiences. Yeah. Um, because in our them. earlier relationship, what would happen is I would listen to Mary for hours and hours about her emotions. As soon as I opened my mouth to speak just one about one emotion... Mary would close down completely. Yeah. She wouldn't even want to hear it at all. She'd walk, get up, walk out. All of a sudden, she had to do other things, whatever would happen. There would never be an overt, no, I don't want to hear you. But, just but it would just happen every single time. And there were a lot of women spirits helping me with that because yeah. I was in avoidance of all these things. Yeah. So, so I suggest I to you, if you're feeling closed down or feeling uh, sort of in a rage about a male, listening to a male about his emotions of sadness about sexual connection, for example, then, then and this applies to the spirits who are here, yeah. then, then actually that tells you that you're actually in a lot of rage with men that you're not willing to feel and grieve. And what you, if you ever want to be happy, the only way is to get through that rage and into the fear and shame and then underneath that into the grief. Uh, and this applies to many of these women's spirits. They are very resistive to getting into this grief. And so they want, to, they want every woman on the planet to be angry with men generally. It's a bit, it's a bit sad in a way because it, if you think about it, uh, just imagine it this way. If, if many of you women have a love of your children, right? Just think about it this way. Here's you. 
here's the man that harmed you, or let's say the men that harmed you. Right? He is a male child of yours. Now, you, if you have huge amounts of rage and anger that you continue to project or continue to feel inside of yourself towards men, and it's rage, uh, and most of the time it's sexual rage, and, and, and for that reason it's very sexually based. And sexual, sexuality is a core of a person's worth, so it's a very harsh emotion coming out. I understand why you would have it because of the harm you've received by these men. But unfortunately, if you don't heal it, this man, your male child, is going to bear the brunt because he is going to be the closest man to you. He is going to bear the brunt of those emotions. What do you think he is going to grow up like? There's only two possible things he can grow up to be. One is going to be a sexual predator himself because of the amount of rage that he has inside of him about how he was unfairly treated. Because he didn't do the damage. These did the damage. So the problem with viewing all men as damaging when you have been harmed by men, and by the way, the same applies vice versa, the problem with viewing all women as damaging when you've been harmed by women is that if you don't release that emotion you are now projecting that emotion towards men or women if it's the opposite way that have not harmed you now is that just it's not just it's not loving and unfortunately these men who have not harmed you will feel the injustice of that does that make sense? Now, how do you feel when you're treated unjustly? Don't you feel often quite angry? Eventually, these men, if they continue to get treated unjustly when they never did the damage, eventually they're going to become enraged, aren't they, with you? Can you see that? They are actually going to have rage in them because of your unfair treatment of them. See, this is a problem that we have emotionally. Somebody treats us unfairly. Let's draw it in red because that's how it looks colour-wise in the spirit world often. They treat you unfairly. All these really nasty emotions enter you. And because you don't want to feel your grief, you then project out at them. And, but usually, unfortunately, you're afraid to project to those men who harmed you because they harmed you. And, so, and you're afraid of them. So you have fear of them, so of course you're not going to project anger and rage at them, are you? Because you're afraid of them hurting you even further. And so what you finish up doing is projecting your rage and anger towards the men who will receive it, who actually haven't hurt you, who you're not afraid of. And that is very unjust. It's an unjust act. And not only is it an unjust act, it lacks courage. Because the real, any, if there is any rage and anger that you're going to you know, feel, it should be towards the perpetrator shortly, not towards people who are innocent. So, well, even this projection, babe, is an avoidance, isn't it? I agree. It's, it's an but if, of what if there is any right, there. exactly. if there's any justice, no, we're not talking about love. No, no, I mean, even this projection of rage is actually a projection of the rage you do feel with these perpetrators, but are But avoiding. you're unwilling yeah. to feel because it of fear. towards yeah. them because yeah. of fear. Yeah. So that is unfair now. It's unfair. Yeah. These are the men who deserve the projection if there's anybody could be said to deserve any projection and I don't agree that anybody can be said to be doing that but but if if we were just about it these are the men who would be receiving the anger not these men and certainly not your own male child right he certainly does not deserve any of it but he is receiving it and sooner or later he's going to be affected by it right so this is where we need to understand the responsibility of not releasing causal emotion. Whenever we decide we've been hurt, whenever we decide to not release the grief of the hurt, 
we are now not damaging the people who hurt us most of the time because those persons are the people we're afraid of. Most of the time what we're doing is we're damaging other people. Other people who are totally innocent of any of these engagements with us and yet we're damaging them. And that's where we need to understand the problem of not dealing with our own emotion properly. Yeah? Taking responsibility. Di, would you like to... I know time's oh. up, but yes. Uh, I feel like I've done more damage to men than I've ever had done to me. In the sense of... Um, personally, you mean? Any had done to you personally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I feel like I've been uh, very spirit-influenced sexually ever since a ch I was a child. Yeah. <laughs> With what was done to me and then how I was influenced as a child and then what I've done as a result as yeah. a woman. Yeah, unfortunately, the current crop of sensitive men, and of which there are some, I must say, they are enduring the abuse for the perpetration of the insensitive and uncaring men. Does that make sense? Yep. And this is something that is very damaging so, uh, because what ha eventually happens is the next generation after that becomes exactly the person that you are afraid of in, in the first instance. So, so let's say there's a generation that say, so here's the woman, she's being influenced by a spirit from an older generation who's in a rage with men. And so for some reason she just has a feeling of rage towards men but she's never really been personally harmed by men very much. You know, she might have had a dad who wasn't present and those kind of things but she's never really, you know, had terrible sexual abuse or terrible or raped or any of those things. But this woman here has. All right? And so she projects to the woman, uh, this woman, you've got to hate all men. So a man comes along who might be quite nice, right? And now he's willing, this might be a man who's willing to absorb that hatred. It has to be, otherwise he wouldn't be attracted. So he's willing to absorb this hatred, so he gets all that hatred. They eventually get together and they have a children's, children. You have a male child. The male child receives all that hatred. He's only going to grow up to be one of two things. He's going to either be a perpetrator of, of anger towards women because of the injustice of his own projection from his mother, or he's going to be a pleaser of women, just like his father. He can only be one of those two. Yeah, he's, more a, he's a woman pleaser. <laughs> yeah, he, he can only ever be one of those two things, right? Now, now, all of that begins with, firstly, this hook between the person on earth and the spirit. And the, spirit. the spirit remaining in her rage, rather than feeling her causal grief and anger, and her wanting to protect this woman by using rage and anger to do so, attracting a man who's also in a, in, a, in a sensitive condition and then creating a child who's either now angry and mad as hell or a woman pleaser. Yeah. Either way, he's going to have quite a lot of pretty hard emotions to work through, yeah. particularly that child. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. My, I guess my other um, question is... I've got so much fear about being sexual again yep. <laughs> because of how awful it got to when I was. Yeah. But I don't, apart from going more into the shame, and I don't quite know where to go without being in a relationship <laughs> to start with. Yeah. Well, the truth is you probably won't get into a relationship while this sexual fear is present. Does that make sense? You'll, you'll be attracting celibacy. Yeah, I, I feel like that's <laughs> what I'm life. doing. Yeah. And uh, many women are doing this nowadays. They're attracting celibacy. They're attracting, you know, se separation, being single for a long period of time. Now, now, if you think about that dynamic, which is a very much a dynamic that's been happening with yourself, the first step you can you see is what are you hooked into this women for, woman for? What, what is the emotional hook that you have with her? Because I feel it meant much of your fear about sexually engaging is actually your fear of her response to it. 
Is that what this says? Imagine she's a mum on earth and mum's in a rage with you every time you ever think about being with a man. That's what this woman's doing to you. She's in a rage with you every time you even think about joining with your soulmate, right? Just, you just think about it and I'm going to hammer you. I know, it's, it's, and it's so much more intense now. Very much so, because you're yeah. sensitive to it more, right? Yeah. All right, but what we've got to do is look at the hook you have into her. Why, that, why, are, why are you, you keeping her with you? Yeah. Why are you responding? It? Now, the hook has to be fear, doesn't it? So what is this fear of? It is fear of angry women. Now, who does that remind you of? <laughs> My mother. So it's fear of your mother. It was fear of mum. You're afraid of your mother and her opinions. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. So, so that's the hook that maintains this connection with this spirit that then means you're now afraid to do anything other than have no relationship. The spirit's perfectly happy with you never having a relationship again. Yeah, and I feel like my mother's perfectly happy that I'm just having a relationship with her now. <laughs> and she's got no partners around and... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. And even my son now wants to sort of go and look after her in a sense emotionally. Of course he will, I he, watch that as well. He'll be yeah. feeling your guilt and other emotions as well, yeah. So so the real problem you face is not to do with your fear of sexual a relationship. Your real problem is your fear of your angry mother and her opinions of you having a sexual relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. And that's the emotion that needs to be addressed first. When you address that emotion, you'll find your fear of a sexual relationship will lessen quite considerably. And as a result of that, you'll feel more inclined to engage, you know, the person who you feel is your soulmate more sexually. Does that make sense? Yeah. If he's willing, Thank of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, he's going to be oh, more what willing. Other things? He's going to be more willing, isn't he, if he doesn't feel this continual fear of, the, of angry, rageful women around you. Because cause what is terrible as a male to feel that your wife or your partner is more concerned about her mother than she is about you. She's more worried about her mother's opinions than she is about you. She's more concerned about pleasing her mother than she is in pleasing you. And, and it just feels like you're always going to take second, if even that, you know. Because the reality is, if, you, if you're afraid of your mother, you're going to be afraid of every other woman. So how it looks, how it looks in terms of the male who's looking at a relationship with you is, like, here's you, with a dress, here's you, a relationship with you, I've got to firstly go through your mum and get her approval of me, which is highly unlikely, but because she's an angry woman who hates men, so you know I'm a man. You know it's going to be pretty hard to get her approval. And then you're bound to have, due to the law of attraction, with this emotion, you're bound to have many friends who are also angry women. So oh, now yeah. I've got to get the approval of all of your friends. Which is highly unlikely because all of them are also angry with women due to the law of attraction. Okay. And then I've also got to get the approval somehow of this spirit that won't even talk to me who's influencing you. Right? So I've got to get approval of the angry spirit women um, who are with you. Now, the average male looks at that and goes... <laughs> I think I'll go for somebody else, you know. Like. <laughs> Uh, he's got to be pretty dedicated about the soulmate issue <laughs> before he's going to before he's going to bite that off, right? Can you see? Oh, yeah. And then, and then, for many women, they also have a feeling. Uh, many women who are attracted to this also sometimes have a feeling of connectivity with their father. So, so now we've got another set of emotions. There's Daddy down here, whether he's in the spirit world or on earth. And he gives her all these feelings, nice feelings of approval and acceptance. And he, she's the special girl and all that kind of stuff. So special girl type feelings towards his daughter. And now this poor old soul mate now has to also get dad's approval as well. But of course he's not going to feel much approval because he's going to be jealous of the, of the woman, of any of the man. Special Yep. You know, yeah. that the woman connects to. And then there's also any male spirits 
who are like Dad, who are projecting that at you as well, that he's got to go through. So now it's going like, whoa. Like, <laughs> how do I have a relationship under these circumstances? And to be frank with it, many of our relationships are through this soup of all these different emotions are being projected at any one point in time. And that's why sometimes relationships feel very difficult. It's not because of the one-on-one -on -one interaction most of the time that, it, that it's actually difficult. It's because of all of these other things going on. All the hooks into everything All the else. hooks into everything else. Yeah. Thank you. Now, I think we're well and truly two hours up, aren't we? There's lots of people with lots of questions, isn't there? Yeah, and uh, we're not probably going to uh, are able to answer any more of them uh, now if we want to get on to the other subject that we wanted to cover today. But uh, I hope you've seen with the sexual uh, discussion and also the sexual questions that we answered a bit about today about the soul. And so I feel, Igor, we can actually... Um, sort of attach this as the human soul sexual, sexual attraction, attraction. Q&A uh, as, a, as a session. Um, you can see that there is quite a lot involved in the emotions with regard to sexuality, isn't there? So it's not, uh, and this is what we need to understand about sexual attraction, is that it's more about the emotions, the unhealed emotions, than it is about sex. That's uh, what we were trying to yeah. say so often yesterday. Very often our sexual injury is not even related to sex. It's related to all the dozens of other influences and priorities we put in our life. Yeah. yeah. And many of us get afraid of relationships, not because we're afraid of a relationship, but rather because we're afraid of all the other people's opinions about our relationship. <laughs> and that get... We get all of their rage and their anger and their resistance to the relationship. See, the majority of us would engage only a loving relationship. Uh, and the only time that we wouldn't engage that, because it's, it's the most beautiful thing to experience, so of course we would engage it. But the only times we don't engage it is because the opinions of mum and dad, the opinions of all of our friends, the opinions of all of our spirit friends, and some of our deep fears are actually not about the relationship with this woman but rather about all of these people's opinions about my relationship with this woman how society is going to respond to this relationship mm -hmm. and masturbating. sorry start masturbating. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we start masturbating instead because there's no other option <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's true too like you know there's many, that's why the sales of vibrators and dildos and everything are increasing because at the end of the day, because most, uh, a lot of people feel more connected to a toy than they do to a person um, and they actually feel afraid of the person but they're not feeling afraid of the interaction with a person necessarily but rather all of these other things that are going on so this is the thing to yeah. bear in mind. And can I just encourage, like, um, I address the spirits in the room but also for the women in the room to just, I know we've spoken a lot about the injuries in women and that is because I'm really walking this path through all of my sexual injuries at the moment and so I believe there's a law of attraction that is even created through that. And just to encourage you all, as I am endeavouring to do, to soften into this, not just the grief and shame that I have inside of me, but the demands and expectations I have on men to help me avoid those things and the unloving belief systems that I have about men um, because I really feel that uh, if we want to be leaders, this is the way to lead from our hearts and uh, in a softening into this true femininity that many of us, even myself as a woman, I feel lacking around me from my own mum in my own self. So I feel we can be leaders in this, um, but it takes humility mm. and a desire to see ourselves. Yeah. And from a male's perspective, there are usually only two directions in which a male goes sexually. One is into sexual arrogance and the other is into sexual neediness. And either one of those conditions need to be resolved if we really want to have a joining with our partner. We need to remove any sexual neediness from ourselves through a process of grieving. We need to remove the sexual arrogance that, that we have through a process of seeing how much demand and expectation we have and how good we think we are in comparison to others. So we need to do 
if we have the neediness, we need to do one set of things. If we have the arrogance, we need to do the other. But, but it's usually one of those two areas uh, that the male needs to go into if he really wants to heal and have a soulmate relationship with his soulmate. Mm. You, know, you can have an all sorts of relationships with your soulmate, but to have a soulmate relationship with your soulmate, both sets of both the female and the male in the relationship, or if they're two males, both males or both females in the relationship, have to resolve their intergender emotional injuries. They have to resolve their injuries with mum and their injuries with dad. Basically, that's where they begin. Yeah, and as you can see, probably, we're quite passionate about this topic because I really feel that a lot of the dynamic within the relationship is reflected in the sexual uh, union that mm. happens in that relationship or the lack of it. And, um, yeah, we both feel, like, really uh, inspired about our own progress in this area and what, uh, what it brings up. So, and yeah. also the amount of joy that you can exactly. receive from the relationship is like unknown on this planet at the moment. The amount of joy you can receive from a relationship is totally unknown in terms of pure joy that's based upon love and truth and, and desire is totally unknown on the planet. And as a result of that, many of us have quite disillusioned with relationship. And, and reality is you, we all have the ability to heal these emotions so that the joy can return. And then this relationship becomes so binding and intense and, in, and, and enjoyable that you don't consider anybody uh, it, it, having a relationship with anybody else. You don't need your mummy and your daddy and your brother and your sister and your friends. You don't need them anymore. And because you don't need them anymore, you're no longer in addiction with them anymore. And now you can love them more. <laughs> And so actually the binding of the relationship can cause both parties in the relationship to become more loving to everyone else as a result. And that's the beauty and the effect that it has in the world around you. So we just thought we'd remind you of that before we close uh, and have some something to eat. Um, after the break, we'll talk about a totally unrelated issue. So, uh, so we'll introduce that after the break. Yeah.